Hello and welcome to Showcase and a look at British publishing, Malcolm X and the controversy over a painting. Welcome to the British Book Awards. It's Nibby's time. We'll look at a book award that focuses on marketing over writing. A Netflix series has put Malcolm X's murder case up for review. And the haters of this painting get taken down by some new evidence. The bookseller is celebrating his 30-year anniversary by picking the UK's most successfully sold book in the past three decades. The British magazine whittled the possibilities down to 30 quite diverse titles. From Barack Obama's memoir to Fifty Shades of Grey to a Jamie Oliver cookbook, the committee says they're considering these books because they defined their year and the publishing trends that followed. Novelist and literary critic Jude Cook joins me now. Hi, Jude. So, uh, when you go back and, and look at the winners, what kind of uh, direction do you think the publishing industry took in the last 30 years? Well, it's hard to, to sort of re reduce that to a direction. I think what you have is a pretty representative list of, of uh, the biggest sellers um, uh, over the last 30 years. I mean, you've got some commercial fiction, literary fiction, cookery books, children's books, um, and bear in mind it's not just for the best writing. I mean, it's put together, this list, by the bookseller, and they privilege sales o over everything, really, but not in a kind of mercenary way. I think the literary industry is, a, is an, an ecosystem in that you need to, to have big-selling books like Harry Potter, uh, uh, Hilary Mantel, um, Barack Obama's memoir in order to drive uh, retail to keep those bookshops on, on, on the street. So I think it's a pretty good representative list. You know, there's some E.L. Gray's Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten the name. <laughs> um, Fifty Shades of Grey, anyway, is a, is a strange one to be on there. But you can see that it's there because it sold so many books. But just to clarify, it's not only about the best selling aspect of the books, right? No, and Peter Jones, who works for the bookseller, said the award celebrates the best of writing and the best of publishing. So you've got some amazing literary fiction there. Zadie Smith's White Teeth, Sally Rooney's on there, David Nichols uh, uh, with One Day, Hilary Mantel. But also you've got books that started franchises, such as the first Harry Potter book. Um, and... The qualification, the best of publishing as well, is important because I think all those books were published very well. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they, they did enormously well, but they took care, the publishing houses took care of their, their authors afterwards and, and, mm -hmm. and made sure that this, this brand became something that readers could buy into. Uh, the Philip Pullman uh, uh, series of novels, for instance, is a good ex example of that. Okay, so Jude. Uh, I have to admit that I'm, I'm a bit skeptical when it comes to, uh, I mean, when people focus this much on the trade aspect of publishing. How do you feel about the fact that they are only focusing on this aspect? Do you feel like they're sort of stealing the soul from literature by, uh, by sort of imposing this pressure of selling on authors? Well, I would argue that they've, they've got the balance right. I mean, Sally Rooney, for instance, wasn't the best-selling book of, of uh, 2018 by any means, her book, Normal People. Um, last year, I think the best, the, the book they picked to win was Jamie Oliver's book, which certainly sold far in excess of Sally Rooney. Okay, Rooney's. but can I so cut you off there? there because, because, I'm sorry, for example, when you look at Men Booker uh, winners last year, Bernadine mm. Evaristo, she can't end up on this list, right? It's impossible, but then she's the winner of Men Booker. So, Sally Rooney was longlisted for Men Booker, but she can never really get that, but she can get this one. So how does this come at play? When I see Sally Rooney on this list, I feel like Bernadine Evaristo could have made it too, but she can't because she doesn't sell as much. And I feel like this is sort of unfair, but please convince me that it's not. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, not, it's not just sales. I mean, it's books that defined their year as well. This is what the bookseller have, have said. Um, and I do feel that with, you mentioned the Booker, the last four or five years, the Booker has been very brave in putting, in, in, in choosing uh, winners that were very much 
you know, hardcore literary fiction, Marlon James, Paul Beatty's book, George Saunders, but there, there needs to be recognition within the industry of sales because those books wouldn't exist without uh, Bernadine Evaristo. You know, her career has been developed very carefully by her publisher, but all those other books, the Harry Potter, a uh, different publisher, but we're subsidizing great books by Bernadine. Okay, tell me which books would make up your short list from this long list. I think the, the, uh, it would be great if a children's book won because they do sell enormously well. So you've got Harry Potter. I personally love Robert McFarlane's book with Jackie Morris, The Lost Words. If it had to be literary fiction, I would choose possibly White Teeth by Zadie Smith. I think it's going to be read in, in, in 50, 100 years' time. And how likely is Harry Potter getting this? It might win it, but then you've got to think about the judges. They've got some very sort of uh, literary people pe judging it. John Mitchinson, uh, Andy Miller of Backlisted Podcast, they're very literary, have a very literary sensibility. I'm not sure they'll choose Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. They might choose a commercial title that has uh, a literary sensibility, such as uh, Alice Sebol's the Lovely Bones, for instance, which won in 1991. But we'll see. I'm sure it's going to be a, a, a surprise and a, and a joy to see who wins. Exactly. Let's wait and see in May. Jude Cook, good to have you back on our show. Thank you. In Africa's Sahara Desert, there lives a massive nomadic group called the Tuaregs. In just Niger alone, there are two million members. But the fallout from colonialism and current-day terrorist attacks have put their community at risk. Despite this, an annual festival featuring crafts, music and camel racing has been going strong for two decades. And this year's program is one big party. <laughs> The Sahara, northern Niger. This desert region hosts the oasis town of Ifaruan. People who come here, we'd like them to remember that there are these places that are still waiting for them, and that will wait for them because they are eternal resources. Millions of Turegs live here and the nomadic community once controlled the caravan trade routes across the Sahara. After French colonial rule, Turegs saw the borders of their lands change, and along with it came political and social instability. Today, they are the targets of terror attacks, and Turegs make up a large part of Europe's refugee population. Despite these hardships, the Tureks celebrate their culture at the annual air festival since 2001. These are high points in the life of the nation of Niger, in relation to the security context we are living in. There is no doubt that Niger will continue to draw on its ancestral values in order to maintain a dynamic of development for peace. And for the tourists who show up, they get a taste of what is not on the news. For us, it's very important to show Europe that in the desert you can travel with maximum security. When the newspapers and TV say that it's not safe, no, it's not true. In Niger you can come with peace of mind. Nearly 120,000 people fled their homes in the wake of Boko Haram terror attacks in the region. The situation in Niger is tense, but sticking to culture here is a counter-terror move worth giving a shot. And now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of the arts and culture. Ben Affleck says he decided not to reprise the role of Batman because it would cause him to drink too much. The actor says a friend told him the script for the latest Batman movie was good, but alluded that the stress in playing the character would cause Affleck to drink himself to death. 
Affleck has admitted to having problems with alcohol, and the movie Batman vs. Superman was critically panned. Look, I was going to go easy on Eminem has joined the Billion View clubs for the third time. His 2013 song Rap God crossed the mark on YouTube with a little assistance from an Instagram post saying everybody loves to root for a nuisance Rap God countdown to 1 billion. The rapper's hits Not Afraid and Love the Way You Lie have also surpassed a billion views on YouTube. Four-time Tony Award-winning actress Zoe Caldwell has died in New York. The 86-year-old Australian had been suffering from Parkinson's disease, according to her family. Caldwell's career was noteworthy for winning Tony Awards during the course of three decades. And The Chef Show is back on Netflix with its third volume. John Farrow and Roy Choi travel to Vegas to make omelettes with celebrity chefs, visit Wolfgang Park at his steakhouse, and pull around with director Sam Raimi over the thrills of baking sourdough bread. Netflix's documentary series Who Killed Malcolm X argues the real killers of the famous civil rights activist got away 55 years ago. The show provides evidence that's so compelling, the New York District Attorney is taking another look at the case. If reopened, it could lead to a blockbuster change in America's history books. We're not brutalized because we're... Malcolm X was shot and killed in front of his family on February the 21st in 1965. At the time, X was on stage for a public address in Manhattan. Three people were convicted of the murder. Netflix's Who Killed Malcolm X contends that two of the three people convicted of assassinating X could not have been at New York's Audubon Ballroom, where he was murdered. In fact, the film argues that the trigger man who delivered the fatal shot has been living in plain sight as recently as two years ago. And the Manhattan district attorney says there's enough evidence to review the case. Historian Abdur Rahman Muhammad says he was prompted to conduct his own research after scrapping the official investigation as haphazard at best, botched at worst. For decades, criticism has dogged the police for missing evidence at the crime scene and not interviewing everyone in the audience. Viewers have expressed shocked in light of the Netflix program. For Americans, it might not just be a massive mistake in their history books, but yet another example of maleficence in the U.S. justice system. The central figure in these new documentary series, historian and investigative journalist Abdurrahman Mohammed, joins me now. Hi, thank you so much for coming on our show today. So, Manhattan District Attorney is reviewing the process. What are you expecting out of this? Well, we uh, anticipate that uh, Brother Muhammad Abdulaziz will be completely exonerated for uh, the assassination of Malcolm X. We believe that he and uh, Brother uh, Khalil Islam, who at that time was known as Thomas 15X Johnson, we believe that the, the district attorney uh, seriously taking a look at this and are sending signals that perhaps uh, they will rectify a terrible wrong that was committed uh, 55 years, 56 years ago. Uh, and that's what we expect that will happen. Okay, how likely are these to happen, considering the fact that this case is so botched like for, uh, for 56 years, as you just said? Well, we think it will happen this time because of the power of uh, television, the, the power of... Uh, like a platform like Netflix, where uh, a case uh, that is so solid, that with the, with the scholarship is so sound, and the uh, the arguments are so irrefutable, that the that the that the weight of history is upon this case, and that it will be corrected. Okay, were you expecting this to happen? The documentary to get this much attention, and uh, the district attorney, Manhattan district attorney, to uh, review the case. You know what? That was always my hope. That was always my hope. I had no, obviously, I had no idea that uh, it would happen, um, you know, this quickly. Um, 
or happen at all, but it was my hope that it would. And I, I, I expected that it would because um, it's not that the case is a, that we're making is a weak case. It's just that the case has never really been put before the world in a uh, systematic and um, methodical manner. What took so long? Indifference. Uh, also, you know, there's, there was an element of fear in the sense that the people who uh, we say actually carried out this crime were very dangerous people and it just was in no one's interest really to, uh, you know, to dig it up. Okay, so you mentioned indifference and fear, but you dedicated 30 years, more than 30 years of your life uncovering these facts. So tell me how that process worked out for you and what did you do in the meanwhile? I mean, you started investigating this and then the documentary comes 30 years, more than 30 years after that. Well, in the meanwhile, you know, I, I lived a life just like, uh, just like any other person, you know, I went to work, raised my family. Um, but I was something of an activist in the community. I was working uh, tirelessly in the Muslim community, in the African American community, and I was um, doing good work. And like I said, I'm just an average guy, just an average guy living his life. But uh, it, it had occurred to me, and it was obvious to me that I had an opportunity to make something happen here. And when you you don't see anyone else doing it, you just kind of do it yourself. Yeah, you're just an average guy who's uncovering important facts for American history. So, yeah, I get that. So, I, tell me how this whole interest started out for you. How, how, did, how did you start investigating Malcolm X's story? Well, you know, I was only two years old when Malcolm X was uh, brutally murdered. Uh, but by the time I entered college, around, around 1980, this was a, a couple of years uh, after Talmadge Hayer had filed his affidavit. The convicted assassin, the admitted assassin, in 1978, he filed an affidavit uh, naming his co-conspirators, his the four co-conspirators in the assassination of Malcolm X. Uh, by 1980, he was doing a lot of television appearances uh, in order to exonerate uh, Norman 3X Butler and Thomas 15X Johnson. Uh, you know, and this struck me as, um, as uh, you know, you know, unbelievable that this man would name the culprits, yet no one would act on his uh, affidavit, and it just laid, it just laid dormant, uh, you know, you know, just unattended to. Okay, but you know, I wonder why you okay, may, you mentioned. Clarify? Please. Let me clarify this as well. By, by around 1986 or so, after I became a Muslim, uh, I began to circulate amongst the, the community and I began to hear certain things that allowed me to put pieces together and, uh, and that's when it really became plausible in my mind that I could solve this. You were dedicated, but not a lot of people were. And you mentioned the indifference, which is really interesting for me because when you look at the widespread uh, nationwide interest, obsession into like Kennedy assassination or Tupac Shakur, killing of Tupac Shakur. I wonder why there was this much indifference uh, towards Malcolm X's murder. Well, unfortunately, because it was looked upon as a case of what you call black on black crime. It just wasn't taken seriously. It was, it was treated as just um, intertribal warfare, and uh, it really wasn't, uh, you know, taken as uh, uh, the brutal assassination, the brutal murder of a national figure like a Kennedy or Dr. King. It was just treated as Malcolm was just... Well, Matt, you have to understand that back in 1965, Malcolm was not a beloved figure. You know, he was not someone that law enforcement wanted to, uh, you know, get to the bottom of his assassination. He was, a, he was a, something of a reviled figure. He was a feared uh, personality. And uh, really, it was, a sense, it was a sense of good riddance. Good riddance, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Abdurrahman Mohammed, good to listen to your journey today. Thank you so much for sharing it with us on Showcase. In 1970, the Rembrandt Research Project had some bad news for a small museum in the U.S. state of Pennsylvania. Its painting, Portrait of a Young Woman, was not an original. Well, recent restoration work done on the artwork has uncovered a big surprise.
For decades, authorities declared one of Rembrandt's students likely made this painting. But two years ago, a portrait of a young woman was sent to New York University for restoration. The state that arrived in our studio, it was completely obscured by a very thick varnish that had degraded over the century. And it was very difficult to evaluate it properly. Conservators say in the 1920s, visible signs of brushstrokes were unfashionable and a previous restorer decided to cover the piece in a thick coat of varnish. But as conservators began removing layers, they uncovered new evidence to the real identity of the artist. With better technology, we were able to obtain an x-ray that um, showed brushwork and a liveliness to that brushwork that is quite consistent with um, other works by Rembrandt. Rembrandt produced hundreds of paintings and used different signatures. Misattributions of his work are plenty. For instance, the authenticity of Portrait of a Man is still being contested. And until recently, following eight years of debate, Saul and David has been accredited to the Dutch master. There is no formal process by which the Pennsylvania Museum can confirm their attribution. But several experts now say if portrait of a young woman was hanging in their museum, they would call it a Rembrandt. As we just heard, Rembrandt was prolific. It's estimated he produced about 300 paintings, 300 etchings and 2,000 sketches during his lifetime. And not all of them were inspired by his love of art. Many were conditioned by what was profitable at the time. And what made money in the Dutch Golden Age was portraits. Married couples, children and businessmen from the 17th century. It's an exhibition of faces. And faces that were once models of Rembrandt and his contemporaries. You can even see the faces of the artists themselves. We think that Rembrandt, like most of his contemporaries, made self-portraits, also for self-promotion. It was a marketing tool. This exhibition started with the self-portrait of the Museo Nacional Tis and Bornemisa, a great portrait of the early 1640s. But what are considered self-portraits in Rembrandt's time are not exactly of what we think of them today. The name self-portrait was only given to these paintings by art history. In, the, in Rembrandt's own era, it would have been called a portrait of the master by the master, because collectioners would like to have an, a specimen of the master's technique and a specimen of the master's face. So the self-portrait combines the two. The exhibition includes eight paintings, 16 prints and an etching played by the artists who were active in Amsterdam during the Dutch Golden Age. Rembrandt and his friends may not have always been working for the fun of it, but what they did for a living left them a priceless legacy. That's it on this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. Our YouTube channel has more from the world of art and culture. But before we wrap up, we'll leave you with some of the best moments from this year's Brit Awards. I want to cry right now. So <laughs> Lewis Capaldi! Wow, congratulations.
congratulations to all of my enemies. Said you care, you missed me too, and I'm well aware I write too many songs about you.